morning. Uh, I must say, it's, um, the view out there looks a little bit better than when we looked out at 9 o'clock. <laughs> so thanks for making it to the session. Um, we're really glad to be here. And I must confess that uh, we haven't, because our project isn't complete, we haven't actually spoken a lot about this to an audience yet, hence my notes, so please forgive me, I'm not one of those, or we are not one of those brilliant speakers we've been watching on the, over the last two days that stand up here and can wax lyrical um, and inspirationally without looking at their notes, so please forgive me for this. Um, but we hope that this session will nevertheless add, if not equal, but at least close to the value that we've got out of the other session so far as we take the conservation lab magnifying glass and you know, focus it on the animal interaction space, which is pretty much what Gavin's and my life has looked like for the last five months. We've tried to run our businesses and at the same time almost got blinked on uh, looking at this subject. So we're here to share a bit of what we've learned, our ideas, the challenges, the process, um, and possibly a bit of what came out of it with you guys. And um, so, yeah, let's go on, go on this conversation. So, to, for a full introduction, I am Kira Powers, uh, Gavin and Gavin Reynolds. Uh, we both come from the inbound tourism industry, that side of, of the business. And I am on the board of SATSA, which is the Southern African Tourism Services Association, and therefore their chair of the project committee that got tasked to look into the animal interaction space. And Gavin is a member of the project committee. So that's where we fit in. I'm going to take you through just the agenda for the next 35 minutes. So this I am going to read to get it right. So I'm going to provide some context to our project and to the subject. Gavin's going to take us through framing the concern that we are still dealing with. I'll highlight some of the key learnings that emerged from the public participation process that um, we've just completed. Gavin's going to cover how we're suggesting a fresh approach um, and why we think this project will be different and hopefully will make a difference. And we'll share some of the anticipated consequences, both intended and probably unintended, uh, as a result. And then this is hopefully going to leave about 20 minutes for open discussion, Q&A, and debate, and, and stuff like that. So I think that's the part that we're looking forward to, and getting a lot of feedback from you and advice um, as well. So seeing that time is short, we want to keep our talk time to the 35 minutes. I'm just going to dive right in. And um, I'm assuming that people attending the Conservation Lab are pretty well versed in the controversies and challenges of the animal interaction space. So I'm not actually... Can we click? <laughs> Thanks. Um, that's it. I'm yeah, pretty much going to leave it here. So I'm not going to go into the, the debates, the pros and cons, the sides of the argument of animal interactions, because I'm sure that everyone here knows about it and, and probably has a very strong opinion about it. I'm just going to give you context to our project so that it'll frame the discussion going forward. Uh, let me start with SATSA, why it was SATSA that, that took this on. So um, what Ryan said, uh, we are the largest voice to government for the inbound tourism industry. Uh, it is an association of businesses and organizations that are involved in the inbound tourism industry. Uh, not outbound, not travel agents sending tourists overseas. And to be a member, all you really need to do is, um, in your application is show annually evidence that you are a viable, reputable, tax-registered and insured going concern. And that, is, that gives you membership. So... Um, it's become, SATSA has become a mark of credibility and reliability in the tourism space for buyers, and also somehow associated with that a mark of integrity. So it's, you know, it came to us as a board over time that if we are standing for integrity in business, then the issue of what business are you in and how are you conducting that business as the tide is kind of turned to look very much at animal interactions, do you have integrity in that space as well, not just as a business practice? So that is, is kind of what led into it. And also, we have a very strong relationship with South African tourism, um, 
in the sector, obviously, and South African, well, what they call brand South Africa, is getting completely hammered and has been and is being completely hammered um, in this space. So they kind of looked to us to see if there was a role we could play. And then internally, uh, amongst our members, there was growing concern about what's happening in this space. So these kind of forces led us to putting out a, a question to our industry saying, do you want assistance? And it was pretty much unanimous. Yes, get involved. We need clarity. We need guidance. We need, to, we need help in how to navigate the increasingly murky space of animal interactions and tourism. Um, right, so our project aims to really lead the industry back to being on track with conservation and wildlife being the cornerstone of the South African tourism industry. Um, because we feel that you know, South Africa in the past has been lauded and has been known for its really good progress and its good best practice in conservation. And this industry is, is definitely tarnishing that. Um, and we know that conservation and, and wildlife is what draws tourists to South Africa first, or the continent first. Any other tourist attraction or tourist activity or business comes secondary to that. So we're all reliant on that image actually always shining. And at the moment, we are taking the shine off that image. OK, so our committee, when we got to work, uh, pretty quickly recognize that this is what we call and, and what academics call a wicked problem. It is not something that we could actually fix, like do a project for six months and we'll come up with a perfect solution and we'll fix it. Because everyone kind of looked to us and said, please fix this. Um, and we realized it is not something that has a silver bullet, silver bullet solution. Uh, so, if this is a wicked problem, what we can do is move the conversation forward and we hopefully want to do that quite significantly. And um, so what we could also do as a committee is look to where we want our industry to be in 5, 10, 20, and 50, and beyond that year's time. And if we call that picture and that destination heaven, then our project is plotting our way to heaven. How do we get there? We can't do a once-off solution in 2019 and think it's going to fix everything. We need to start the work that will get us there. And we want to keep as many people in the conversation as we can. Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. Um, all right, so we're trying to get to heaven, not, a, not an easy um, objective. Uh, we also recognize quite early on that what is happening in response to and in tackling the animal interaction phenomenon and, and this reaction and response from all over the world is a social movement. It's not boxed into the activists and animal rightist corner. It is a social movement. It is taking over. And South Africa should, because of its role in conservation on the continent, we should be wanting to not only react to this, but stay ahead of the curve and ahead of the wave. So our project, again, wants to pull our industry, possibly kicking and screaming, um, forward ahead of that curve to actually be on the right side of history here. Because we do think that it is a turning point in the tourism industry's history uh, and, and, and what it does around the world. Obviously, this is not a uniquely South African uh, occurrence in the, in the tourism industry. Okay, so that's the context. Um, I just want to outline a few of the parameters of our study as well. It is limited, unfortunately, to any tourist-related activity where people are sold access to interact with animals. So it's a bit like the TRC. Everyone wanted it to deal with everything, but its mandate was gross human rights violations, and now, 20 years later, we wish it had dealt with land issues and so on. So we have a restricted mandate, and we can't be held accountable for a whole lot of other stuff, which includes things like hunting, fishing, eating, trading, and farming. So we are explicitly not focusing on that, but we are very aware of the linkages and where there are the linkages to those activities that falls within our, in our study. Okay, and then also kind of parameters, I wanted to explain a little bit about our committee because it is a question we get a lot, um, that we don't have experts on the committee and we haven't got equal representation from, say, the animal writers and then the animal activities and so on. So the committee and, and the consultant, we do have a consultant appointed because we all have day jobs, um, 
were chosen very purposefully not to be from any of the sides involved in this debate and actually not to be the perceived experts. So we aimed for people who could hopefully be objective, people of acumen, intelligence and diligence that have probing minds and are hard workers and ones that are involved in the industry but not in the issues and that could provide robust oversight and guidance to the process. And in the process, we will seek the knowledge and the expertise of the experts and from all sides of the debate and the argument. And, and we'll use that as our material. But our job was really just to be hard workers to give robust oversight. And then very lastly, as context, um, we were determined from the beginning, and this will come out in, in some of the findings also from our public participation, that we wanted this to be very much rooted in Africa. So you will see when we publish that there are references to our local character traits, to um, seeing that this is a South African study, our constitution, even to a Concord ruling. Um, that has come out on, on something related to the space. So we, were, we really wanted to, to do the study rooted here, rooted in our people, rooted in our animals, because anything that is um, devised abroad may not, well, we've seen won't be fully adopted and owned by the local industry. So that's my context. Um, so the next section is over to Gavin. He's going to frame the concern, as they say in the academic world. Thank you. Celebrating powerful women in the industry. Love that. Kira and I are married as well, just to create further context. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> God. She's spoken for. She's spoken for. <laughs> Jesus. So it, it adds an interesting, interesting dynamic to our lives. Um, there's nothing like waking up in the morning and say, babe, I just had this thought about animal interactions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, send, a very important part of, of, of this conversation for us was to successfully frame um, the concern in such a way that our whole study uh, is geared towards um, solving that concern or answering it. Um, and, and we did it as follows. We say that our concern is that the, the interests of animals are not to be uh, subordinate to the commercial benefit that we as humans um, gain from their existence. And that was our central departure point. So what we've done is we have elevated the, the conversation about the interests of animals um, to be at least equal to the consideration of the interest of people. And we are negotiating that, that tension between short-term uh, commercial and self-interest and the longer-term conservation and sustainability interest. Okay. Uh, right. <laughs> that was quick. It's back to me. Um, I do get blamed for talking the most in this relationship. Yeah. All right. So... <laughs> Um, so what, yeah, what I was going to add next was to share what we got as standing out as key findings from the public participation process. So our approach in the project was pretty standard. We hired a consultant, um, and uh, that's BDO, they, they were Grant Thornton, and they do a lot of consulting to the industry, but that whole appointment came through quite a rigorous uh, government procurement process because we are funded by South African Tourism. Um, so our approach was standard. There has been extensive uh, desktop research. So it started as the first step, but it has continued um, all of these months. We're five months in. We're hoping to publish the end of July. Uh, so there were really extensive desktop research. Uh, then there was two months of a public participation phase. So we did 10 public workshops in all nine provinces of South Africa. And the invitation to participate went um, way outside of our membership base. I mean, we really tried to publicize that anybody who wanted to be heard or learn about it was welcome to, to come. And then also more than welcome to put in written submissions. We also did a survey. It's been online, obviously also for people that are outside of the country. And we've done interviews, uh, both internally, with, domestically in South Africa, and internationally, for example, uh, you know, with our 
tour operators and biggest markets and, and so on abroad. So that's been the approach. And then we have this committee to to steer and and give guidance to the consulting process. And from all of this material, we are you know going to come up with with what we need to deliver. So that was the approach that we've taken, really standard. Um, the public participation workshops were really interesting. Um, so I've got 10 things that came out. They're not particularly um, mind-blowing. It it's really shows to me more how like really like human character kind of base this, this whole debate is and who our industry is. We're not a very um, sophisticated industry. A lot of businesses are... Uh, owner-managed, family-started, small in the, the small to medium enterprise space. So uh, these are really ordinary people trying to make a living, and then there are some big hotshots that make a very good living. Um, and and then obviously there are a whole lot of voices uh, in the NGO space and um, the animal rights, animal welfare, and that kind of space. So um, I'm just going to go through the ten points. Uh, firstly, we found that the industry was really united in its clamor for intervention, they really uh, like needed someone to step in and help in the space, and they welcomed the move on SATS's part to do that. They were also really united, as I mentioned in the intro, of wanting a local pronouncement, a local study done that involved local voices instead of relying on things like the ABTA, the ANVR um, processes that have done brilliant work, but is kind of pronounced on an industry, a whole continent, and away from them. Uh, so that, that came out. And surprisingly, what we found is that more respondents would like us to have or to develop an accreditation system out of this than not. This is not something that, that SATSA actually conceived or intended to do or would even like to do, and it's not something we necessarily will do. But it came out of the workshops very strongly that people would like an accreditation that could tell them, you're doing okay, or you suck and fix yourselves up. Um, and that ties in, I'm actually going to jump to number nine, which is that no one thinks they suck. Um, it's really, it was fascinating that over all the workshops and the interviews, everyone really believes in what they are doing, that they care for other animals, love their animals, got a, a decent business going, and um, that whatever ends they have more than justify the means. So, so that was really interesting. They often think that other people are doing things wrong or doing things badly, but we found no one that said it's me. Uh, that, was, that was quite interesting. Um, we found that there was a real sense of banding together across sectors to try and improve the reputation of the industry. There was far less antagonism and conflict in the workshops than we were expecting. We thought there would be quite a lot of like, difficult space to navigate that, that we would actually have to facilitate. Then we found much higher levels of ignorance in our industry than we ever expected. Um, people really not in tune with what we've called the social movement, haven't kept track of it, um, and were kind of surprised where they thought they, there was criticism or an anti-reaction to them. They thought it was really belonging to activists and not to their customers. So that was really interesting. Um, so, number seven, we spent much more time educating our industry prior to being able to consult them than we expected to have to do. Um, number eight was, yeah, that there was a real appreciation of, of SATSA getting involved. We got a lot of feedback after, after the workshop saying, you know, thank you, this has been great. It was almost like um, a sense of relief that voices had been able to be heard, that they'd been able to vent, and that they thought something was someone was doing something about it instead of just talking and accusing and, and so on. Um, but what concerned us is that once we stepped into the ring, the fact that we're a tourism association has kind of been overlooked, and now it's looking like, oh, Sats is going to fix this uh, for everyone. So <laughs> that's a challenge. Um, and lastly that there has been some anecdotal reporting from the participants that they hadn't really got concerned about their viability as businesses or their longevity in the market um, because 
after, say, our sharing of information, they in hindsight could see that they had seen a drop off of business from the tour operator space, which is you know, a major channel and driver um, of, of business in this industry. Um, they hadn't noticed that drop off because with, I think, the South African tourism pushing, doing a lot of effort marketing to our Eastern Indian markets, um, that business has filled the gap. And then also, obviously, the huge rise of direct and online bookings and systems and platforms, so that if tour operators that maybe are aligned to APTA or the Dutch or so on, or just on their own, have shifted away from these kinds of activities, the direct market accessing customers without having to adhere to other guidelines uh, was, was really filling the gap. So the drop off, the market determining the demise of this industry, um, we still think will happen, but it's probably going to be slower in this country than we expected. So yeah, those are some of the major outcomes. And yeah, there's a, there's a comment there from my side as well. So um, what was interesting is you almost had the sense that the, the opposing voices on this issue had never been in the same room together. There was, there was um, when, you, when you have people in a room together where they, are, where they for the first time perhaps have to articulate their argument directly to the person representing the opposite view, um, it's, it's not that easy and, and, it, and we didn't get the fireworks that we thought we would get. The whole, the whole industry seems to be under a bit of a grey cloud at the moment and it's almost like everyone is going, just put us out of our misery. Tell us if we're on this side of the line or that side of the line so we can get some clarity about how to move forward. So even the guys in, in innocent activities which are not really on our radar at the moment, they, they say they're also feeling the, 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 the bias towards animal inter interactions per se. And that, that all sort of um, um, enhances conversation about the process that we're going through at the moment is actually a really big thing. And, and I think the further we get down the line of this conversation, we start to understand just how big this issue is and, and how important it is that we make a difference and how, how, um, how unique our opportunity is to actually shift that conversation. And then finally, the, the, the idea that even if we had to terminate our process today, we believe that we would have already moved that conversation forward um, uh, as, as a result of these interactions that have happened that we've never facilitated before. Cool. So over to you to talk about our approach, our fresh <laughs> ideas. <laughs> okay, so, so um, the key part to this process is that whole issue about so so what are we going to do different and, and how is that going to make a difference? Um, and there's two things that come to mind. The first one is that, is that we need to have a, a tool with high utility. Um, I think that if, if we could go to the whole industry and say, you guys are okay and, and publish a list of these are all operation activities that are acceptable and these are the ones that are not cool, then that would solve the problem. Anyone would go, okay, well, that's easy now. We can just speak to these guys. We don't need to speak to these guys. Because both the, the, um, the, the, the travelers who make their buying decisions when they arrive in South Africa versus the guys who work through tour operators, in other words, the tour operator make the decision about where they go, they are all looking for clarity. But unfortunately, this is a really, really complex issue. So we can't do that. Um, the second one is, is, um, is that we, we understand because we have limited time and limited resources that we're not going to solve this process and we can only move the process and the conversation forward. For the process to continue after this, we intend to establish a solid principle uh, foundation, a theoretical framework on which this conversation can continue once our process is complete. So, how we intend doing that is, is to establish a, um, what we call an ethical framework that will, that will contain those, those principles and, um, and codes that we will use to deliberate ethical dilemmas. Excuse me if I refer to my notes. Um, so, the way that you see this working is that is, is almost like we're going to apply filters to the industry. Now, there's a legal filter you apply to the industry. Are these operations legally compliant to 
to our legislation, which has gaps in it at the moment. We understand that. Um, the second one is we might look at a specific activity type, and we say, how does that conform to the principles of our framework? We might look at a specific um, uh, type of facility and say, if you qualify yourself as a facility like this, do you meet the criteria of that type of facility, and are you therefore okay or not? The third one is that we're going to have a species-specific filter, and in that instance, we might have to refer um, decisions uh, about um, are we meeting the welfare requirements of that specific species to a, a specialist panel of, of, uh, or a committee that can deliberate on that once the process is complete. So the, the way we, what we also intend doing to differentiate this process is to, is to draw a line in the sand that we believe we can, we can do in such a way that it'll cut out 80% of the activities that are undesirable. Um, the, the, more we, the more we deliberate this issue, the more we explore the ethical sides of it, the more our conversations are converging about certain activities, no matter how you dress it, are undesirable and cannot be condoned. Um, so the other 20% that's left behind, I think we will leave to a panel of experts that will be able to make the right decisions, and also we have to, cr to create space for, for new activities that might happen in future um, that, are, that are not even currently on our radar. The, the other thing that we hope to achieve um, to make, to differentiate our approach is that we, that we in time, will invert um, the conversation so that before people start animal interaction activities, that they actually first consider the ethics of their operation and make sure they can justify that completely before they start the activity as opposed to having the activity and then afterwards having to subject it to ethical scrutiny. Um, The other thing that, we, that we're very clear on that we'd, we'd like to achieve is that we want to increase the moral sensitivity of the, the stakeholders in this process. Um, we, we believe that by, edu by educating people and by asking very specific questions, um, we can, we can um, uh, increase moral sensitivity, which will then improve moral decision making. And, uh, and move the conversation forward that way as well. And does the other point out of color? Intended and unintended consequences? Yeah, so it's important to start reflecting also on what's going to happen once this process is complete. We have no doubt that, that when certain, uh, certain activities and certain facilities are identified as as undesirable, that some of them will be, will be forced to close. And two, two key consequences come out of that straight away. The one is that there will possibly and probably be a, a loss of jobs. The other one is that you'll have a whole bunch of animals that need to be looked after. Um, we, we encouraged by two conversations that we've had in the last week. The one, the one is uh, with, with um, a, one of the big um, hotel groups in the country that that through a series of conversations with, a, with, a, with, a, with activists, we're driving a conversation quite hard, and through our intervention as a committee to say, look, I think you guys need to perhaps consider elevating this conversation to your senior management team and actually take a, take a stand on, on animal interactions which are uh, indirectly promoted through your, through your hotels um, that, are, that are located close to these facilities. And they actually took a decision to take all the brochures of this particular activity um, uh, out of their, out of their uh, premises. And immediately, there has been an impact on the specific activity. Um, and we had a conversation with them at Indaba, and they said, guys, like, we, we can feel the impact. We know this is the action, and here's, here's the, the reaction to that. Um, the other one is that um, this particular operation as, as actually they're having a conversation about, geez, we're going to have to reinvent our business model. There's, they, we, we have a situation, we have a bunch of employed people, we have a bunch of animals over here, and if we stop doing this particular activity, we're going to have to find solutions for that. So that gets us into a different conversation, interesting conversations about how do we then address that issue? How do we address the issue of, of, of animals who's, uh, who can no longer be looked after because of the funding mechanism which is this particular activity has dried up.
Can um, I jump in there? Yep, sure. Um, yeah, so just, just to, to maybe flesh out what Gavin said about um, undesirable activities having to close. That is, n is not something we can make happen. We are not a regulatory authority. Um, so actually our entire result of the study has no legal teeth to it. It will really be uh, a tool of influence on the industry. So this thing of like things will close, it will be a process of that we're predicting that through lack of business, through, through lack of sales, they, won't, they will be unsustainable. So that might take time. It's not like we're going to walk up to their front door and you know, put a chain and a lock across it and say, you can't do this anymore. Um, we, yeah, we don't have that power, but we do, where Satsa does have the power is actually through, through business and through influencing the choices of customers and buyers and the big players, the big tour operators in the market, um, and, and then through education. So we really, we don't see this process being limited to our members. That we've got 1,300 member companies, businesses. Uh, that is by no means 100% uh, of the animal interaction space, and nor is our membership base 100% animal interaction owners. So, uh, so it will be, we want this message and the movement in the marketplace to, to be way beyond just our, our, our member base. Satsa, anyway, the work that we do is not only member focused. Uh, if it's just an example, um, one of the biggest, strongest voices and hardest champions um, in the you know, fight against the unabridged birth certificate situation and the biometric visas and um, visa countries and that kind of thing. And that benefits everyone in the industry, not just 1,300 businesses. Uh, so, so this again, we wanted to benefit everyone and, and, and um, infiltrate the whole marketplace, not, not just our, our membership base. Uh, so, yeah, that I well, just that's, that's to add. A, that brings us to that final point about, um, uh, well, that one point about SATSA membership as well. One of the key things that we still have to get agreement on is what exactly this is going to mean to SATSA membership. So we get asked the question, we say, does it mean that everyone involved in animal activities will, not, will no longer be a member of SATSA, or how are you going to differentiate that? How are we going to grade people? Are you going to um, use a, uh, uh, what's the term we use? Accreditation. Uh, accreditation process, et cetera, et cetera, which is something that uh, we are quite wary of. Yeah. Um, uh, because of the pitfalls and, and experiences of, of, of entities such as the uh, uh, as fair trade, etc. Um, so that, that mechanism is still being deba debated, but it is very clear that, that the, the SATSA, SATSA brand is being used anyway as it is right now for people to kind of legitimize what they're doing. So there's, although the, the, the brand is only, in, only intended to, to verify that you run a business that is that is, uh, that is financially viable and it has all the insurances in place, people are saying, hey, I'm a SATSA member, that means that what I'm doing is okay. So we need to say, well, it actually doesn't mean that, and people are using your brand to do that anyway, so you might as well take a position on this. So it's, the conversation is really involved with SATSA saying, we, we, we are going to take a very strong line on this, we're going to draw a line in the sand, and we're going to, to make this some aspect of our membership criteria to deal with this. How and exactly that will happen, we're still baiting at this stage. Yeah, and something else I didn't say earlier that uh, when I mentioned like that the nature of those involved in our industry, kind of the, the level uh, of of businesses, uh, we also in looking at all the guidelines out there, and make no mistake, uh, there are a lot, there, there's so much material out there. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to rewrite what other studies have already done or rewrite guidelines that are already there. We actually want to use those. And a little bit like South Africa's constitution, you know, written in, published in 96, it could benefit from every other constitution ever written. Um, so we want to use the best parts of, of other stuff out there and then make it more applicable or implementable in our local context. Um, and in so doing, what we found with other guidelines is they're actually quite complex. Uh, they are also repetitive. Um, so we found that, you know, you're not, we don't think that a 
buyer, a tourist, nor a company is going to go through reams and reams of columns and criteria and tests and everything to come to a decision, especially if you're clicking on TripAdvisor and you're just going to book something. So we realize that although our study is going into a lot of detail and the material will be available um, that we've gone through, we, we're you know, going to put it all out there, we want the resultant tool to be very simple so that people can actually adopt it. So we're talking about a high utility tool rather than guidelines. So because we want it to be used. We want it to be used by businesses and we want it to be used by customers. So we're not sure how we're going to do that yet. We've got two more months to figure that out. But we would like it to be simpler and more usable than what we have found out there already. Yeah, so there's also that sense of, of elevating the conversation to, to, uh, to a higher loftier goal. Um, uh, to link it to something that will make a difference in 100 years' time. We find a lot of the conversation at the moment is there, there's, a, there's a social movement that are one of the primary drivers of this conversation that's really drawn a line over here. And we have a lot of conversations happening over here about still just trying to justify what people are currently doing and their current business models now they're making money. And you're saying, guys, this stuff's not relevant anymore. You need to get ahead of that curve somehow. And that, that curve, that line is currently determined by people sitting overseas trying to make a judgment call on what we do in South Africa with the APTA guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that guideline process is, is not, like, like Kira said, is not, is not user-friendly. It's not something that you can, you can hand to a tourist and you say, listen, use this to inform your decision. It's way too complex. It's way too, you look at it and go, no, I can't use this. Okay. So, um, um, you know, that lofty goal, that thing will make a difference in years' time. It's really a conservation of species. Um, um, which, which is the goal that we all share. So we're trying to elevate the conversation to that level. We, one interesting experience that we had during the workshop is that we had this, this ostrich farmer in, uh, in Oatswell that stood up and he said, guys, you know what? Five or ten years ago, I can't remember the time frame that he referred to, but he said, I took a look at, at this industry and I, and I said, you know what? It doesn't matter what I believe is right or wrong. There is... There is Something is changing, something is shifting, there's a social movement, social conversation happening that is, that is busy overtaking what we do and we're still trying to justify that it's okay to ride ostriches, etc., etc. And he took the decision to actually close down all those activities in his business. And today he's thriving and, and, the, and the, the message that he had to, these, to the rest of the operators, they're still, still fighting for, for what they believe is, is justifiable and saying, guys, uh, that conversation has passed you. You, know, you need to get ahead of the curve. You really need to overtake the conversation by, by looking at your business uh, critically and saying, this is no longer acceptable. It's not about what you believe. It's, 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 it's why the conversation is being driven outside there. So that was, that was quite a... That was, that was an important shift in, in someone that's already done it on the ground to say to the other guys, there's a different way to go about this conversation. Yeah. Okay, so we, we're going to wrap up... Um I thought it might be interesting just to know that, like, the kinds of, of work that, that we have looked at. Um, and also a point to say that we, in this work, we, we have done, we've looked at the legal framework in South Africa, uh, nationally, provincially, it's, it's, it's quite different and, and quite difficult, and we've done a gap analysis on that, and we have been asked to also pass that uh, a sort of summary and, and what we've learned out of that back to government to see whether there, there will be steps to be taken in the regulatory uh, field and the regulatory side of, of the industry to assist. Uh, there have been obviously f huge conversations focused on trade and so on and, and now uh, looking at uh, animals sort of in the tourism industry as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we have been going through everything that's, that's published in the industry that we could lay our hands on in terms of guidelines, uh, journal articles. We've looked at science and social science, studies done on human-animal relationships to studies done on animal behavior and needs. We've reviewed case studies of captive animal practices and related records of injuries and fatalities. Uh, and our legal framework, like I've mentioned. And most significantly, we've done a lot of... Um, exploring around the, the academic field of ethics and, and ethical frameworks to, to decide how we're going to, what ethical framework we are going to use because we really are needing that to underpin our work. And um, we, we had some great, we've uh, met a prof at UJ who um, has published 
wonderful stuff on an integrative approach around uh, animal rights and, and, and business and so on. So pretty much uh, roped him in. Uh, okay, so I'd just like to end off with an example of, of ethical reasoning that, that we've come across. I think it just shows a lot of, about the conversations we've been having, um, and it'll give us all food for thought. It is more writers than, than, than what Satsa is, but I, I, just, I just like what this guy's written. It's by Gary Francione, or Francione um, an American legal scholar known for his work on animal rights theory. And he says, the welfarist position retains the idea of animals as being property and fails thus to recognize the inherent their inherent value. Consequently, it is simply a way of making the exploitation of animals more efficient. He contends that instead of leading incrementally to the abolition of animal exploitation, the welfarist position will in fact lead to its entrenchment. Norm normatively, he proposes that we accord to animals the basic right not to be treated as property, and this requires that we seek to abolish and not merely regulate in institutionalized animal exploitation. So that's just interesting because we deal with a lot of, uh, you know, we, 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 um, we have a lot of animal welfare discourse in, in this space, and this guy's arguing that it actually um, entrenches animal exploitation rather than getting beyond it. Okay, so I know we started really late and timing has been a bit skewed um, this morning, but Ryan, over to you as to how much time we have to engage in questions and discussion and advice and, and all the rest. 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Aha. Hello. <laughs> have you got a microphone? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, you can all hear me. Um, I actually have uh, two questions. One probably leads into the next one. Um, the first question is, what exactly is defined as an animal interaction? <laughs> and secondly, what? where does one draw the insuperable line? Mm. So it obviously depends on the first question. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious lines, and, and uh, we're going down to ostrich, as you mentioned. But what about penguins getting fed at the Two Oceans Aquarium or kids playing with amoebas and, and things like that? So where, where is there, is there a, a sort of thought about where one draws that? Mm. If I, if I may, um, so in, in terms of definitions, when, when we publish, we actually, one of our, our very early steps, um, looking at all the, the material, is to uh, list the definitions that we have um, determined to work with so that there is clarity about what we're talking about. Um, so without having that published in front of me, in, in terms of our study, animal interactions is where there is a business transaction, so people are being sold something, sold a, a promise, an image, a, an experience, uh, and this involves their engagement and interaction with animals. Um, so we, we specifically haven't used the words captive wildlife necessarily because there is captive wildlife just being bred and, and farmed. Um, and also, it looks like as we're converging, so bear in mind we have two months to go, uh, so we don't want to declare everything um, as given right now, but um, we're also pretty much converging around the idea that this, these are animals in, in contained spaces that have no freedom to move away from the engagement that is being imposed on them. So you may automatically think of something like um, shark cage diving should be in this, and is it or isn't it? Be, um, so we're thinking right now not so much because obviously those animals have the freedom to approach or, or go away um, with no containment. Um, so, and then you said the line in the sand. So the line in the sand is something I'm really not comfortable to say this is where we're drawing it because that is actually the whole purpose of our study and the tool that, that follows from that. Um, but it has certainly been the big part of all our consultation is everyone else's opinions of, of, of where that line is, what everyone else feels. And as you can imagine, <laughs> it moves. There's quite a, quite a spectrum. Yeah, maybe just to add to that. So, so I think a convenient line would have been to say that all animals in captivity for human entertainment is wrong. If we, if we could draw that line today, it would, it would simplify the whole situation. It would provide extreme clarity. But there are huge consequences to that type of line. Um, so we, we feel we have to be more, more um, 
cautious about the approach. We have to um, um, try and draw that initial line um, in such a way that we, that we really capture 80% of the bad stuff happening out there. And, and I believe we can do that. I believe with the, given the limited time and resources, there are certain industries, maybe some of the stuff that you mentioned right now, without being specific, that we can say this is really not cool no matter how you dress it up. Um, there, there are instances that, that are the animals will be procured where the animals go uh, once the activity is complete or when they get to a certain age and all the rest of the stuff that needs to be considered. But we want to make sure that our, our reasoning is, 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 uh, is of such a high level and standard that, that, that the principles hold even once our process is complete and we can continue to apply that to new conversations. And, and then there's obviously the issue that, that I mentioned uh, earlier that that there are there are more specific instances where it's an activity that is that is generally considered not to be uh, um, uh, bad, at a lack of a better word, that we we still would need to to have a conversation about um, if the activity per se is not is not that that um, uh, that uh, despicable. Uh, is the welfare of the animal involved in the activity still maximized? So one of the consequences of this conversation is that we believe that, that anyway, for all animals in captivity in South Africa, we believe that there will be an increased welfare to those animals, the ones that do remain in some kind of activity, uh, which, which, we, uh, which, which will be on the right side of that initial line that we draw in the sand. And, the, and the, an idea of a line in the sand is that, that it is a line that, that we can shift as, as um, the moral sensitivity increases as, we, as, as the, the, the level of conversation matures amongst the participants in the conversation, as we can, we can say that the trade-offs, the, the, the benefit that we gain offsets the, the, the downside of the conversation in terms of, of the implications of, of, of shutting down specific activities and uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I also, sorry, coming to you, is it Anthony? Um, Something I, I, I did want to point out, sorry, bef before I take another question, it links to the, the keynote that we heard on the first night um, uh, here, and then also the work of the Tourism Conservation Fund, for example, which I'm a huge believer in, and, that, and, and also this idea that this will be rooted in our local circumstance, is not to, to forget that very much a part of the local circumstance is this idea that we need to address uh, the, the, the people involvement and human benefit and community benefit out of the wildlife um, tourism economy as much a, as animals. Uh, so that is, a, you know, that is a huge, huge factor when you're looking at the uh, sustainability of, of businesses because obviously it it's, it's involves employment. And if we have nailed our colors to the mast saying that we want um, wildlife tourism to benefit communities, we have to be sure that we're not completely um, cutting that off by not allowing um, opportunity around wildlife to, to benefit communities. So it, it is a very tricky space. Um, so if I may go to Anthony the, and then, and then the, the, there's come one more to quick, you. There's uh, one quick interesting comment to, to, to perhaps also elaborate a little bit on that. Is, is there's a sense that, that um, the longer we can keep more people in our conversation, the more we can actually achieve transformation of the industry as well. So that, that's one of the delicate balances that SATS has to consider. Do you just say, these guys, oop, we don't want to speak to you anymore, no more SATS membership. In other words, you just effectively drop them off the conversation, drop them off the forums. Um, or is there some way that you can keep some of the conversation with a very clear agenda and a very clear timeline about transformation that is expected and improve the situation by doing that? So I just want to plant that seed. Okay, good. Thanks. Um just want to say, first off, I do support your initiative in terms of not exploiting animals for short-term uh, human gratification. Um, I'd just like to offer a bit of a left-field view that we mustn't um, misunderstand what drives people, in my opinion, to want to be close to nature and close to animals. And perhaps it's an expression of that a natural link that's just being misguided. Mm. Um, I think uh, a good historic case where our behavior is emulated in nature and vice versa was in Samburu in Kenya probably 15 years ago where a, a lioness adopted a um, Bisa oryx calf, a Hemspoke baby. 
a lion looking after the lamb, um, or calf in this case. There was this natural curiosity, perhaps maternal instinct, that was misguided and wanted to care for something else. Um, I think it's not too far off, um, not too far off um, those of us that have um, dogs and horses that have once wild creatures, mm. where we take them from their mothers uh, at the age of several weeks old, and they mal imprint on human parental figures. And that's become common and normal practice throughout the world. Um, so that, that love of wildlife and domestic animals is an inherent connection that we mustn't deny. We just need to question who's going to be the judge because I love my dogs and I love my horses, but I don't want people to fiddle with wild animals. But at some point we, we do exploit that yeah. um, as commonplace. We did actually, so, so when I went through um, some of the material that we covered, that's where the social science came in, because yeah. we've actually you know, looked at the studies that why is there this draw? Why does animal interaction you know, take place in, in Thailand, India, everywhere, actually all, all places, um, yeah. that humans are drawn to being close to and have contact with uh, animals that you know, aren't domesticated. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we have looked at that. And final quick point. Um, I think it actually translates to the hunting industry where I think a lot of the, the hunting clients that uh, come from all over the world are probably seeking a close interaction with nature. It's not the killing of the animals that they're seeking. It's that, it's that um, connection with that nature that's expressed through a hunt that could otherwise be a wilderness trail or a safari or yeah. time in the wilderness. And I think that that close connection between human beings and our system should not be misunderstood as us being the superior being, but us being part of the ecosystem trying to interact with our fellow natural citizens. Thank you. Right. Well, yeah. I, I think maybe just a quick co comment on that as well is, is the, the, the fundamental issue for us, and this is what we're doing through our conversation, hoping to achieve, is that we, we are considering in the process of creating whatever interaction have you considered the interests of the animals, at least on the same level as the human beings? And looking at this as part of, part of a, a, um, a, a larger ecosystem, so we, so we don't historically just look at, at what achieves the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people, but we say what achieves the greatest benefit for the greatest number of species. And that we, that we don't just look at how awesome that activity is, but saying, hang on, what does it take to get to that activity? And, and have we considered the interest of the animals, their psychological interest there, their, uh, their bi biological interests and their needs. I hope that answers some of that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment. I went to the Galapagos, mm -hmm. and obviously they've got like a very pristine ecosystem there. And, uh, and I was told by people over there that for them, the way they were drawing the lines was anything that would permanently alter normal animal behavior. And I thought that was actually quite a good line. Thank you, we can look at that. Thanks, yeah, as much advice as you <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> In fact, that's why I actually brought my notebook. Hello. Um, you guys, oh, sorry, sorry. Go. <laughs> sorry. Um, you mentioned that uh, in the process of consultation, people were interested in having some kind of accreditation that they could refer to. Um, I'm curious what you would perceive to be a challenge in that accreditation board being recognised as, I guess, an industry voice um, and one that could be trusted and who you would perceive to form part of that panel. Okay, maybe, maybe I can venture into that one. Yeah. So, so um, the, the challenge with, with accreditation process linked to an organisation like SATSA is if you get that wrong in any way, then, then the credibility of everything else you're doing is, is compromised. So I think our, our thoughts are going more towards, a, if there's going to be a accreditation process, it needs to be done by an organization outside of SATSA. Because SATSA does not have the resources, financial resources, or the expertise. The, don't pretend to have the expertise to make those calls to decide which, which uh, facilities need to be accredited, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's where the conversation is going at this stage. Um, and we're very, very mindful of the pitfalls of, of that process. And, um, 
and also to the changing nature of, of uh, one of the things to consider is the changing nature of facilities. So you, you assess something today and the practices appear to be in line with what is reasonably accepted and then tomorrow they add one activity that crosses that line. And, uh, and, and how, do you, how do you regulate that? How do you, how do you make sure that you're always on top of that curve? That requires manpower, that requires resources and expertise. There was a second part to your question. Sorry. The one was why, why the accreditation is seen as, as difficult. Um, yeah, and just also who, who would you perceive to be um, appropriate in terms of members of industry, scientists, NGO, who, who would ideally form um, that process of accreditation in order to either name or shame mm. operations? And, and I think in, in verbalising that question, it kind of highlights the difficulty. Um, that, and I think it also highlights that SATSA isn't um, that kind of body. What we would... We're thinking right now is when we, we come up with our results, it will have, say, the criteria or the, the framework and the, the filters and the, the tool, um, but we aren't the organization that can run that annually and, and consistently. Um, so in our legal framework at the moment, the NSPCA is, is mandated to do the, the animal welfare uh, checks and, and even there, you know, they, they are struggling and they can't keep up um, and there's a lot of resistance. So, so we could either identify an organization that has the capabilities and infrastructure and resources to do it and see whether they will take it on and have to, you know, find a funding model um, or form a, form a panel. And then those exact lists of things would have to be chosen from, the NGOs, the experts, um, the legal guys, you know, we, we haven't actually looked at that next step. So we're looking at our project and our outcomes and our tools, and then if the recommendation from us is that such a panel should be set up or an accreditation is the better way to go, that would be a whole nother phase. I don't know if any country out there represented here has got that right. We'd like to know and <laughs> learn from you. <laughs> yes. Yes, my question is a couple of things. Um, I'm not from South Africa, and where I come from, we don't have any of, of this. Um, so how, does, how do you see at the beginning, when you started this, that the, this kind of activities uh, negatively on the South African tourism industry? Because mm. I, ah. I don't see it where I come from. Um, so how does that happen? And secondly, can you give me a couple of examples of the, of the worst of, of these activities? Uh, that you totally disapprove of, and a couple of examples of those that you would accept. Okay, so um, I'm just going to click through some slides. Um, so for an example, if we're looking at the industry, you don't actually have to read what's up here, but look at the, the brands. Tui Group, Thompson's, Thompson, sorry, Thomas Cook, SDA, Saga, G Travel, Virgin Holidays, Dare Touristic, a big... Um, so, so looking at how has brand South Africa or how has um, South Africa been uh, negatively perceived? So it's happening mostly... We, we, we see it, we notice it, we track it um, in our industry. So I can't speak of, of outside of that, really. Um, so and, and tourism in South Africa, traditionally and still, it may change, but still, is largely driven by major partners abroad and tour operators, big, big machines that package and sell and push tourists into the, the sausage machine that comes to South Africa and other destinations. But um, there are, are ones that really have Africa as their, their main market. Um, and they, through their industry associations, and I think their change in moral sensitivity um, in other countries, uh, have major objections to, they are offended by um, animal interaction activities. They, for whatever their reasons are, see it as inappropriate, wrong, they don't want to support it, they don't want to spend money there. So they are writing company policies. So here, for an example, company policies, I think the easy and, and obvious one some years back was around whales and dolphins and, and that and aquariums and, and marine kind of stuff. But um, we, sorry, I'm trying to keep track between what I'm seeing and what you're seeing. 
Um, so there we go. Um, so there are now company policies and association policies that, so if you're a member of, of the entire British Association of, of Travel Operators, um, you are compelled, you're obliged to stick by their policies of no longer selling animal interactions. So um, there is a opinion against South Africa for having so many of these activities. Um, and that's what we call, that's what we speak about when we say brand South Africa is being damaged. And then there is the, the practical thing of actually companies being told, you know, they, they can no longer um, do this and they don't want their customers to either. Um, there are obviously large campaigns as well um, around like advising tourists, really trying to educate them not to, to do these activities. I'll give you more. So TripAdvisor no longer sells tickets on their website, they can have a review or something about an activity, but they won't actually sell. Um, and um, an even more kind of thorough policy coming into effect in 2018. And then this was really interesting when we were doing our research um, on TripAdvisor, the top questions about South Africa that came up. Um, and here, you <laughs> the funny one was about... Um, traffic officials. Um, but then, you know, after prophylaxis for malaria, you've got what is the reality of lion cub petting? And um, I think a lot, the, you know, the, a lot of international opinion was swayed when the, um, who was the famous lion that got hunted and killed? And Cecil, Cecil of course, Cecil. Um, and then, of course, the whole Blood Lions campaign has been, I think, instrumental in shifting, in shifting thinking. Here we have Instagram policies um, changing, so just heightening awareness in, um, in individuals about, you know, selfies and, 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 and animals, animal activities, and then just in general media and pamphlets and brochures, more and more um, Africa Geographic's other publications coming out, a lot of this kind of headline um, associated with cruelty, traveling, how to make better decisions um, in your travel choices, around animal interactions. So I'm just gonna, sorry, flick through this um, to show you kind of examples of, of the types of, of material. So, so this, is, this is to answer your question, and we've seen it in, in data and in, in stats um, around the results, the results of this. So, so that is what we're reacting to. And then examples, um, I, you know, <laughs> Okay, so let me let me let me deal with that. Should we answer that? I mean, we can, but should yeah, we? we can. I think we can talk about some of it. So, uh, one key thing I don't know if you covered it in the beginning is that SA Tourism is funding this process, and and obviously they they've got at the heart of their concern is is um, is a damage to brand South Africa if we don't clean up the industry. Um, I, I think we see it less as the primary concern as uh, but as as a positive consequence of, of going through this process is that we will have uh, positive spin-offs for brand South Africa. Um, so I'll park that one there. So, so in terms of bad activities, um, uh, obviously the key thing that's in the spotlight is, um, is uh, lion cup petting. Um, and, and, and primarily that is a problem because of, of the whole supply chain and, and uh, the, the petting tourist-related activity just being one part of, of the of the production line of young, anim young animals being separated from their mothers to go through uh, a process of being available for tourists to interact with us through cup petting. And then as those animals grow up and, they, and they're too old for petting, then they, then they make part of a, a walking activity. And when they're too old for walking, then what happens to them after that? Um, and, and you just simply look at a business that, that has this activity and you say, well, if you have so many young lions coming through your process and then in a few years' time, they, they go into a pool of animals that are now too old for any type of activity. What happens with them there, and where do you keep on getting these little ones from? So it's the ethics and, around... And the period of useful life is six months. At three it's, months, they can be petted. At six months, they're too old. So for the next three months, they can be walked with, and then they are too strong and powerful. So that entire useful life is six months. So, so, that's, so that's, that's, that's what we term one of those bad activities, if you wanted to, to have an example of one of those. And then, it, then it's a matter of which activities are currently on our radar. You know, where's, where's the low-hanging fruit? What's the stuff that we really make, need to make the, 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 the most definitive, uh, take the most definitive position on? Um, if you look at things, for instance, like um, shark cage diving, 
I think a key a key differentiator for us that 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 takes that I think in a way off the radar for now is the fact that those animals are not captured and then and then interacted with. So they are in a sense free to to engage with the boats that take visitors out to see them. The 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 method of attracting to the boats. I mean, there's controversy around that, but but that is that is less on our radar than the than the other things that are that are overtly there and overtly against what we believe is reasonable and uh, and ethically justifiable you um, asked also for example of <coughs> something on the other side I, um, these are facilities let's say that that can substantiate and and prove their um, reason for existence and and their work is around um, a true sanctuary um, true rehabilitation um, or true conservation. And there is then a, a question mark, and uh, because another category you could say is true education. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a great debate because there's no doubt, actually going back to what Anthony says, you know, I, I don't know how many people in this room are passionate about animals or conservation because of contact they had or how they were educated with ambassador animals or, and so on. So this is where, this is where the debate gets um, quite woolly and, and really interesting. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, they're, 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 there's no doubt um, work being done that, that should be allowed to continue, um, and yeah, so, these are the things we're navigating. Yeah, so where there's an activity, where there's an animal that, that, that cannot look after itself and is then in, a, in a, a captured environment and it needs to be looked after and fed and you're looking for a funding model to keep that animal alive and to keep on paying for that care, you know, then those would be sort of the activities that would be on the, on the, uh, on the acceptable side of the, of the, the spectrum. I the hope that, that sort of roughly answers without going into too much specifics. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let me just finish that. The difficulty with that whole thing is we're not going to go around and look at every single animal in captivity and every single facility. That's why we, we need to have this um, ethical framework underpinning uh, the decisions and, and the, the strokes. Um, so there is no ability or, or capacity to go and look at every single individual case. All right, so one more question. Or advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I think it's illegal to advertise swimming with dolphins in South Africa. I think because I I was researching a story in Mozambique, and I know you can swim with dolphins in Mozambique. And I think my editor had a problem with me because she said we we had an instance before where we got into trouble for writing about swimming with dolphins, and it was, it was a legal thing. I'm pretty sure it was illegal to advertise swimming with dolphins. And if you look at the industry, they'll advertise ocean safaris and things, but the physical swimming with dolphins, I don't think, is legal. So I don't know if there's some way to harness that, and why, why does it apply only, applicable only to those animals and not to other wildlife? Thank you. Um, I will look into that in detail. It may be related to the laws around um, the distance. There is a specific... Um, distance that you have to keep away in, in uh, boat-based marine uh, activities, so whale watching and dolphins and so on. So if you have to keep that distance, then you certainly can't be as close as swimming with them. Um, but then, of course, if you're scuba diving or, or just snorkeling and diving, it's, um, you aren't in control of that. So, yeah, so, so, so indeed, our, our legislature of Africa does not speak to, to, uh, to all the instances of that. Um, behavior and and one of the outcomes of the process is that that we will have a gap analysis of where we think um, regulate, regulatory intervention needs to happen and and hopefully guide the regulatory authorities in that process. We can't regulate we can uh, or or, uh, or prescribed with any uh, any power to regulate. We we can only self regulate as it were. So we don't make laws. We don't have the power to do that. But we can definitely point the guys in the right direction, which will cover those those loopholes of where they exist. And yeah, okay, last, just also that we have noticed that uh, as with much of South African law, it's all written before certain things happen. So in our um, study, we found that there was always a presence of um, animal, say, uh, captive 
um, animal experiences like zoos or animal theme parks. But the first presence of things like sanctuaries or research facilities or education facilities or rehab facilities becoming commercially available to tourists, um, usually out of a, a necessity for finding a funding model, that, that presence became a plethora and the range and variety of activities expanded and exploded really in the last sort of 15 years. So our laws were not written at a time where these kinds of things existed, and that's why they aren't regulated. Um, so, so yeah, we at the regulation, obviously, um, government stuff takes a whole lot longer, and we're trying to fill the gap in the meantime. All right, are you wrapping us up? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to add something. Um, yes. I, th I think there is two things in the debate. There is one which is about how you address people doing something wrong in the industry, but also it's also possibly about uh, warning some of the tourists mm. that uh, f that their love for animals might be actually put them at risk. Mm. Because I think that one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we have very funny species. We are uh, very often victim of a phenomenon which is called anthropomorphism, mm. which is basically when we try to attribute human quality to other things. You know, we buy a boat, we call it a she, we buy a car, we give it a name. You know, all these kind of things. And when we see an animal, we want, we're desperately seeking this connection. And, and very often to do it, we do the things that is the easiest to do is we give them food. And because they get dependent, we think they love us. And I, and I think there is a bit of a confusion sometimes is that we, we confused uh, what we want, what we think the animal think of us, and what actually our real relationship with them. And there is a real danger there and people who think that they're doing something good when they're actually doing something very wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's why I quite love what they say in the Galapagos. They say that actually changing animal behavior is not only uh, you know, putting them at risk in terms of uh, them being afraid of human, but it's almost as bad when they start to love you mm -hmm. because they become dependent and you have totally changed the way they behave and the ecosystem. And for them, they don't want it to change, so they are very fearful about you can't do anything that alter permanently the behavior. I think that's where a large part of the volunteerism industry um, arose from and, and centers on, is uh, getting gap year students or, or youngsters coming out to take care of, of African animals because they, they need looking after and they need to be loved and cuddled and cared for and, and because they're orphans or something. And um, that actually spurred a whole sector of the industry that is largely unnecessary. Um, so, so absolutely. And then um, on your first point about educating the consumers, really, it, um, one of the studies that we looked at did a really great, like extensive work on looking at this exact problem that we're looking at. And their verdict was that because it's not illegal in any of the countries where it's happening, that's why it's happening, um, that it is too big a problem to tackle uh, at the activity level, similar to poaching, um, we would like we should tackle the market and the, the demand rather than trying to catch the poachers on the ground. So with animal interactions, if you educate the tourists and say that your care or your desire to be close to animals is harming the animals, that his advice was Moorhouse was his name. He said you the only way to fix this industry or move it into a better space is to educate the consumer educate the demand side and not waste your time trying to get businesses to choose, make different choices because their choice will always go back to money. It's not going to go back to morality. And this becomes responsibility of organizations like SA Tourism in their marketing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Right. Thank you, right. Kira and Gavin. Um, yeah, let's hear it for them. <laughs> <laughs>